1960s, John Betjeman made a series of films in the West Country for the ITV company in Bristol, TWW. He was in his mid-50s, not yet knighted, not yet poet laureate. In the years that followed, these films disappeared. It was assumed they'd been lost. Then, 30 years after they were made, a number of unidentified film cans were discovered in the vaults of HTV. And, curled up in these rusty cans, a series of 15-minute gems. Almost everything we are going to see in this visit to Malmesbury is what has been here for centuries and will, please God, be here long after we are dead and buried. John Betjeman's TWW films were directed by documentary filmmaker Jonathan Steddall. Here in the sound of Grey St. Mary's Bell. Cakes, kettles, coaches, schoolboys. Fare you well. In 1962, Jonathan Steddall was 24 years old, and these were his first films. His cameraman on the series was Tony Impey, sound recordist Ian Bruce. 32 years later at HTV, the team are reunited to inspect what remains of their work. Five of the ten films intact, uncovered by producer Jerry Dawson. Well, I didn't even know about the films. You know, I was just researching an archive series, and I was going through old film stores everywhere. And I was just doing a simple thing. I was taking film out of the can, like this film, Western Supermare. And I was just looking at it, and if it had a brown stripe on it, it meant it had magnetic sound, so it had the original sound. So about three or four weeks after I found this can, I looked at it, and I saw Western Supermare General Station. I saw John Betchman with his straw hat and his plastic mat come out. Come out. I turned up the sound and he said, Western Supermare, Gem of the Somerset Coast. And I thought, this is really something. And I kept on looking and all the, all the films exist. And the condition of the pictures? The condition's generally not bad. Sometimes it's quite scratched, but it, again, it's possible to do something about that. So, you know, they come out very well indeed. I, I think they're pretty good. I mean, they were wonderfully photographed by Tony. I remember them originally. The photography yeah. is stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Had we shot the, the series in colour, you would have had a big problem because um, colour doesn't last that long in storage. They always black and white. You know, we're going in for item. So um, we were lucky. I think old films look much better in black Indeed. and white. Indeed, yeah, they? that's true. That's true. Yeah. Richard, you had to sort the sound out. What were the problems? Well, the initial problem was a, a film which was been sitting in a vault for 32 years. The soundtrack was on a magnetic stripe, actually physically with the picture. And unfortunately, over time, it had come unstuck from one side of the film and got stuck on the back, which meant that there were huge dropouts or bits of sound missing from the original. Yeah. Um, so what did you do? <laughs> Uh, panic to start with because we thought we'd never find any of the original In fact, Richard again. Crosby did miraculously find uh, the original the tapes audio recorded audio. on location all those years ago. Now, nearly as good as new, is Betjeman's film on the theme of tea time in Marlborough, the town that housed his hated public school, Marlborough College. The commentary he wrote in verse. Oh, crisp and cold, this Wiltshire winter's sun. At Marlborough Grammar School, the work is done, and home to tea by walls of brick and flint. This boy strolls slowly, that one starts to sprint. Tea time on Marlborough. I remember taking him there to do a, a recce for this film, and it was the first time he'd been back to Marlborough since he left. At you know, at the age of 18, and I could hardly get him in the gates, because he so hated the place. Well do I recall the sudden impact of the hockey ball, the running in from games, the hearty shout, speed up, Betjeman, mind what you're about. <laughs> Uh, 
I must tell you that whenever I look at an old building in England, and Bath's full of beautiful old buildings, when I see a particularly beautiful one, a sort of evil voice comes into my ear of a developer coming down from London who says, um, oh, well, Mr. Benjamin, it's all very well for you to speak about uh, old buildings. You don't have to live in them, do you? Out of that kind of joke, if you like, we, uh, we dreamt up this film on Bath, which is a, is a commentary um, of Betchman talking to a developer. Only Betchman's doing both voices. Today, building must express itself honestly and sincerely, as, for instance, in uh, this feature, which uh, might be termed the vital buttocks of the construction. As you can see, it expresses its purpose, whatever that may be, sincerely, and this causes it to blend harmoniously and naturally with the Georgian on the left there. Each age should express itself as it really feels, and you can see how this age feels about Georgian. Well, I suppose you may be right. You must know what you're talking about as you make such a lot of money as a developer. People think of Betchman as, uh, in connection with architecture, for example, but when you were with him, I mean, he was, of course, interested in buildings, but he was also interested in who built the building, who lived in it, who was living in it now, uh, what their names were, what they were going to have for breakfast, all that he would fantasize about, and we tried to bring that out in these films. The film we did in Clevedon, um, which is about a hotel in winter where old people live, and it's just a day in their life, and it's a, a very long day. And he does a commentary that is imagining their thoughts, uh, what they're feeling, uh, which is the kind of thing he would do anyway. Yes, he was, he was endlessly intrigued about everyday things, yes, too. Yes. I mean, absolutely. Never, never bored. You could never imagine Betchman being bored. Everything interested him, uh, particularly people. One thing about being in an hotel is that you're independent and you can pick and choose who you want to talk to. Which reminds me that I must go down to lunch. There's someone there I said I'd have a glass of sherry with and I don't really think I ought to keep the old dear waiting any longer. He fell to the floor with a thud and his brains were scattered all over the carpet. <laughs> Despite the humour, I still remember this as being the saddest of the series, seeing these people, yes. all, some of them quite wealthy, but at the yes. same time, this is how they were going to earn their days on this earth. The so treacherous and slippery, a single fall, and you may be in bed for months. Still, one must take exercise, it's so important. He would write me notes. In fact, I've, I've got, I found his treatment for the Western Supermare fell. So this came after he and I had wandered round. Uh, it's rather wonderful. He says here at the beginning, I can't read it all. I presume I could read it at the time. Um, general remarks. Visually, there will be a temptation to do just one more film about pleasures and fairgrounds and ice lollies, kiddies, swings and roundabouts. We must resist this and make it Western. The characteristics of Western, apart from its mud, <laughs> situation and donkeys, are, and then there was this. But it's also, he says here, I now give a suggested, and he's underlined suggested, uh, I now give a suggested treatment. I realize Tony MP and Ian and you, something, 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 this treatment is only a suggestion. So, I mean, he, that's what I meant about him um, working very much as a team. Um, and, and I think in a way all these films grew out of our interaction.
It's nice to sit down to something you haven't cooked yourself. Give it your uncle Frank, Makes a bit of a change from home Give cooking, it too. I wonder if I ought to have put on a coat. He seems to have done. Well, we don't have to wash up afterwards anyhow, and that's a blessing. We never, as far as I can remember, got letters from people complaining about really what is a kind of very personal commentary mm. at times, imagining, you know, what, what people are, are doing, who they're writing to, what their names are. Because, you know, I think he was essentially uh, kind. He wasn't a cruel man. He was a very perceptive man. He understood, for example, the importance of, of uh, letting images speak, not just flooding them with words. Yeah. I mean, he, he sometimes used that as an excuse to be a bit lazy and said, oh, well, that, that sequence doesn't need any commentary. And that was probably because he wasn't feeling like writing any commentary. Well, you've got to find dinner somewhere, haven't you? I mean, they don't allow you back to the hotel till five o'clock, and you've got to eat. It's a long time between breakfast and tea. There's a nice phrase here. I don't know when I've enjoyed anything more than our tours of the West Country. A laugh round every corner. And that's certainly what I remember. I mean, a lot of laughs. They were lovely to do. Quite a good model, isn't it? One of the sights of Western Supermare. Ah, well, it's a curious thing that most of what we like to look at nowadays has to be make-believe. In part two, John Betjeman's film of Marlborough. Oh, crisp and cold, this Wiltshire winter's sun. At Marlborough Grammar School, the work is done. And home to tea by walls of brick and flint, this boy strolls slowly, that one starts to sprint. Tea time and Marlborough. Youth's most magic hour, the clock strikes four from grey St Mary's Tower. Strong, bold and old, portentous and profound, o'er gabled roofs that bell has echoed round for centuries with its releasing sound. For centuries too, these alleys have run down to the broad high street of the red-tiled town. There in the traffic roar, the schoolboy stops, safe in the calm of colonnaded shops. Tea time and Marlborough. Lucky seemed to me those boys and girls who could go home to tea, to carpets on the floor, to sister, brother, fire, pictures, books, enough to eat, and mother. But what of us, the boys of Marlborough College? Five years we boarded here, imbibing knowledge. Five years we shivered in exiguous shorts. Five years we ran to changing rooms from sports.
serenely flowed the Kennet till it froze. Peaceful the place looked in the winter snows. But was it peaceful? Well do I recall the sudden impact of the hockey ball, the running in from games, the hearty shout, speed up, Benjamin, mind what you're about. And then the dread when to my house I got, whether the shower water would still be hot. Oh, blessed heat, reviving frozen limbs, where in the steam we chanted songs and hymns. Shades of my prison house. They come to view just as they were in 1922. The stone flagged passages, the iron bars, the dressing gowns, the faggings, hacks and scars. As they come back, the memory comes to me of my enormous appetite for tea. A meal I now decidedly detest, but which in those days always seemed the best. Of course, the college teas were just a joke. You only ate them when quite stony broke. The boys who had to queue for tea in hall had spent their pocket money, that was all. The dining hall we are looking at is new. I wonder if it smells of Irish stew in the same way the old one used to do. I wonder if they call the butter Marge. I wonder if they grumble and enlarge on how the tea is made from stewed up socks and how the cakes are harder than the rocks. I wonder if they talk of art and song. Hurry up, Huggins, pass the marge along. Or hotly argue, blame or praise or grouse about the match and who will be cock house. Dear boys, I leave you to your luscious fare, tea time and more. Let us look elsewhere while you are eating merrily in there. Cross from the dining hall and see those still with pocket money having tea in a strange quarter known as Upper School, run, it is said, by democratic rule. Ah, how a schoolboy, when the kettle sings, lives in a world as rich as is a king's. How sweet are tastes to him, how deep his dreams, how hopeful and how possible his schemes. Though he can mix what turns old stomachs sick and bite through slices thicker than a brick and live surrounded by such smells and sights as would give older people sleepless nights. Though he seems reckless, worldly, dashing, free, still he is not what he pretends to be. Let's join some seniors in a study tea. Brewing, we called it. Though it's like a slum, it's round the gas we hear the gossip hum. It's round the gas and with the jam and toast we hear the rumours that delight us most. You don't say. Oh, good heavens, he'll be sacked. They say the doctor caught him in the act, forging his health certificate. Absurd, he couldn't have. It's just the doctor's word against his own. Well, if you think so, good. This is all right better than college food. Those study teas, the gossip I have known since first a Marlborough study was my own. The stories, jokes and laughter that we shared, first gettings on with those for whom we cared. After the noisy life we'd known before, we liked the quiet of studies all the more. We liked the taste of food we'd cooked ourselves. 
We liked to look around and see the shelves with our own things and view our decoration, symbols of laughter of our own creation. Parents with boys at boarding school, remember that dreadful void from autumn till December. A ten bob note, even a postal order for something less, restores the stomach's order. You need not eat the things they choose to eat. You merely need to make them feel repeat. You need to recollect the ravenous craving for most peculiar dishes. Though you're slaving to keep them there at school, a timely quid will make them love you more than once they did. Recall the hunger that a schoolboy feels, nor boggle at the strangeness of his meals. is the Bentley in the high street there. Perhaps a richish parent. Don't let stare. But in the lounge room of the castle and ball, my own embarrassments I well recall. My terror, lest my family said some word that others listening might think absurd. I talked in quiet tones. We tried to be nonchalant, silent, very ordinary football, the test match, anything would do that others round us wouldn't listen to. Terrified, lest an enemy murmured, that's his sister over there, the one with pats. And in the poly tea rooms, Marlborough boys and Marlborough parents make a gentle noise consuming cakes and eatables by dozens, with brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts and cousins. Tom's for the scones. My dear, how quite delightful. Not too much butter, for my figure's frightful. And in the sweet relaxingness of tea, the strain dies down, and all is harmony. Marlborough and tea time. Now we have in view the traffic that is ever passing through. Another world from our accustomed group. A travelling world that's always on the move. Coach load on coach load pours into the town, stops half an hour, but never settles down to more than just one plateful of the best. Then on to Bath and Bristol and the West, or back to London's syndicated food, synthetic life and hurried, angry mood. A lonelier world of strangers, sadder far than those more stable Marlborough tea times are. Time to digest a sausage, time to fly. So Marlborough sees the other world go by. Here in the sound of grey St Mary's bell, cake kettles, coaches, schoolboys. Fare you well. In the early 60s, John Betjeman made a series of films about the West Country. In the years that followed, it was thought they'd been lost. His film of a county town, Malmesbury, 
and his affectionate portrait of retirement by the sea, Clevedon. Clevedon, Somerset, a Victorian seaside town of gabled villas, wide streets and trees, spaciously laid out by the Eltons of Clevedon Court on their own land a century ago. The Eltons, patrons of art and letters, whose forebears are buried in the parish church here, as is Arthur Hallam, Tennyson's friend of In Memoriam. Clevedon, there, twice a day, the seven fills, the salt sea water passes by, and hushes half the babbling why, and makes a silence in the hills. Well, it has been a cold February, hasn't it? The holiday makers left months ago. The younger folk have all gone to Bristol to business, and at this time of the morning, it's only us old people who are left behind in the hotel. Ah, oh, it's nice to know I haven't got to get up in a hurry anymore to see to someone's breakfast or to catch a train. Nice in a way. It's nice to have my own breakfast brought to me in bed. They're very kind to us here. Of course, there are quite a lot of us, all sorts, so that we can keep each other company. Sometimes people put their wireless on too loud, and that's a nuisance. I'm in number 11. You needn't be afraid to come in. And I shan't get up yet. Not now. I've got this new number of the lady. I'm very comfortable here, really. I've got a nice room, and they allow me to keep some of the things I used to have at home so that it isn't quite so impersonal as most hotel bedrooms. Of course, I don't go down to the lounge early in the morning, what with the whir of the vacuum cleaner and the smell of furniture polish. I don't feel wanted. And people like to be left on their own after breakfast, don't they? They're not exactly sociable then. I must say, it's a time when I like to be left alone myself. There's such a lot to think about in the morning. The news, it's nearly always bad. I thought I'd better let you know that I've decided to settle down here more or less permanently, or for as long as they'll have an old woman like me. My room looks over the Severn Estuary. Some people call it the sea. I've got that photograph of you on your wedding day by my bed. I hope you're both still as happy now, as you were on that day. Of course, I had rather a lot of trouble arranging my things, but by putting a chest of drawers in front of the chimney piece, I've managed to get together quite a little gallery of family photographs. There's you and Betty, either side of that group, taken in India long before you were born. I've put some of the ornaments from home on this shelf, there's a picture of the fourth generation, and above it, one of me as a little girl with my mother. One thing about being in an hotel is that you're independent, and you can pick and choose who you want to talk to. Which reminds me that I must go down to lunch. There's someone there I said I'd have a glass of sherry with, and I don't really think I ought to keep the old dear waiting any longer. He fell to the floor with a thud, and his brains were scattered all over the carpet. With a sweet white wine like this, I think one ought to have a dry biscuit. It brings out the flavor a little better. We could put them into a jumble sale, couldn't we? Oh, don't you think they're rather too good for a jumble sale? Well, we could sell them privately, then. I hardly like to do that.
One thing about staying alone in an hotel is that you do manage to overhear the most extraordinary conversations, just as you're dropping off after lunch. I've got a date with a plumber. I've got to go meet him. With who? A plumber. <laughs> oh, why I guess you Who could you better have a date with than a plumber these days? See, he goes to take you off the doesn't he? Expect me when you see me. Are you going to take the dog? No. Why not? Clevedon in winter. Too misty today to see the distant hills of Wales over there across the Severn estuary. Of course, at our age, we have to be very careful at this time of year. The steep hills are so treacherous and slippery. A single fall, and you may be in bed for months. Still, one must take exercise. It's so important. Oh, I wouldn't miss my afternoon's walk for anything in the world, whatever the weather. Clevedon in winter beloved by T.E. Brown. There is no colour but one ashen light on shore and hill and tree. The little church below the grassy height is grey as sky or sea. And far below you hear the channels sweep and all his waves complain as Hallam's dirge through all the years must keep its monotone of pain. Ah, well. Back to the hotel and tea and chatter. An hotel tea time, the hour of cosy confidences and wondering about this and that. I think he was a traitor to us in the A bit too old, I think. I don't can't express the feelings. Beverly always said, well, butler's a chap to do it. Yes, I, I, I can't express it. I think Anthony Eden, I played, he played him false. I'm sure he did. Poor Anthony. Mm. He played him false, but he did. Did he? I'm sure about that. And I don't like him, and I don't like the way he's never got any sympathy for the victim. Has he never? All the prisoners. Yeah. Oh, he would have had a hair of that. Five o'clock. It's hardly worth getting the evening paper, is it? There'll be the news at six. Ah, oh, now, shall I dress for dinner? It'll be something to do, and I can have a bath, and then down to the bar. I always look forward to this moment of the evening. It takes me back, you know. I've been all over the world, to shepherds at Cairo, when Cairo was Cairo, and we were there, Raffles Hotel in Singapore, and I've stayed in government houses, when we were the chief nation in the world. I've seen Monte Carlo, Cannes, Nice. Oh, I've done everything. But you know, I'm very happy here. And it's because I'm interested in people. I always say, you're only as old as you feel. And I feel young. There's always someone to talk to here, like you, for instance. I must say, I prefer whiskey to these synthetic cocktails they drink nowadays. It's a good, clean drink. Family photographs. This is the latest she sent. I think it's rather a good one, don't you? Our youngest granddaughter, taken last summer. Couldn't we both go there? Go out next summer. It would be such a change. Or do you think we'd be in the way? Dinner will be served in the dining room from seven o'clock onwards. No, I don't think I want any savoury tonight, thank you. Oh, right, go to town. 
and falling hard for someone who shoots a line. But so if you want me to fall for you, Jack. Well, I suppose he's good in his way. But I must say, I preferred Jack Buchanan. He was so much more gentlemanly. How tiresome it is there isn't someone here who knows which knob to turn to stop all those lines going across the screen. Personally, I'd rather they switched it on to something else. I wonder if it's the BBC. You can never tell these days. I get tired of watching all this teenage stuff. There's no need to watch the television. With a little self-discipline, you could read a good book. Bedtime. The long, long corridor and another long, long night. Do the old sleep well or badly? From their hotel bedrooms perched high above the Severn Sea, are they lulled to sleep by tide filling the gap between Somerset and Wales? Do they remember Tennyson's lines on his friend Hallam, buried here in Clevedon churchyard? When on my bed the moonlight falls, I know that in thy place of rest, by that broad water of the west, there comes a glory on the walls. Thy marble bright in dark appears, as slowly steals a silver flame along the letters of thy name and o'er the number of thy years. The mystic glory swims away from off my bed, the moonlight dies, and closing eaves of wearied eyes I sleep till dusk is dipped in grey. And then I know the mist is drawn, a lucid veil from coast to coast, and in the dark church, like a ghost, thy tablet glimmers to the dawn. Here in the upper room, in the porch of Malmesbury Abbey, far away in the north of Wiltshire, are some illuminated manuscripts drawn by monks in the 15th century. Flowers and leaves and fruit. I dare say they couldn't draw very accurately, but they liked the small flowers, the unregarded weeds we throw out of the garden. They liked them for their shape and colour. And almost everything we are going to see in this visit to Malmesbury is what has been here for centuries and will, please God, be here long after we are dead and buried. Ordinary things. Flowers and trees and streams here in the Wiltshire meadows, among small elmy hills in what's considered good hunting country. First, just soak in the atmosphere of the place. William Morris, the Victorian poet, craftsman and socialist, dreamed of just such a setting as Malmesbury has when he described medieval London in the opening lines of his poem, The Earthly Paradise. Forget six counties overhung with smoke Forget the snorting steam and piston stroke. Forget the spreading of the hideous town. Think rather of the pack horse on the down and dream of London, small and white and clean. The clear Thames bordered by its gardens green. Small and white and clean. That's what Malmesbury still is. You could throw a stone from the town down into the country where we're standing here. I don't think words are needed in a place like this. The birds are enough. Small rivers run round three sides of the town. Malmesbury, 
is a city set on a hill. And these rivers which surround it are the beginnings of the Wiltshire Avon, which flows on to Bath and Bristol and out into the estuary of the Severn. No concrete paddling ponds for the kiddies, no litter baskets, no neat municipal flower beds, real country. Sluices, mill ponds, mill leets, and clear streams. Real country laps right up to the three reedy shores of this limestone town. You wouldn't know, driving through Malmesbury in a motor car, what a sacred and peculiar place it is. You wouldn't know what gives it an atmosphere one can almost touch and see. But this is what does it. This is what makes Malmesbury different. It was one of the chief places of pilgrimage in the Middle Ages. Its huge Benedictine Abbey was a center of learning of European fame. And I know you haven't seen the Abbey yet, but you will. There's a sense of expectancy here, so near as though we ourselves were pilgrims from the past. The Abbey was the shrine of Old Helm, the Saxon saint, and later Bishop of Sherburne. And in Malmesbury lived King Athelstan, Alfred's grandson, the first king of all England. He had a palace here a thousand years ago and was buried in the Abbey. William of Malmesbury, the most famous medieval historian, was a monk here. And in the Abbey, there were relics of the true cross and a fragment of the crown of thorns. The Abbey had 16 chapels, a west tower and a central spire higher than that of Salisbury Cathedral. What made people go on pilgrimages in the Middle Ages by boat up the river, on foot along causeways, and on pack horses through Maori lanes. Partly, it was their form of holiday, like our expeditions to the Costa Brava. Partly, it was to find God. They thought of Christ very much as God made man who had walked on earth. Just as in his lifetime in Palestine, people struggled to get near him through the crowds, if only to touch the hem of his garment, so they plodded along to Malmesbury, in their patterns and clogs to see the relics of his cross and thorny crown and to be near the shrines of his saints and kings. Possibly they came along this very path by Daniel's well on their way to the city set on a hill. And as they crossed the last river and reached the outskirts, they looked up and saw the end of their journey there it is, on its hill. Even today, it's very much as it was then. For Malmesbury has stayed the same size, growing neither much bigger nor smaller. The arched gateways by which you used to enter it by road have disappeared, but it's still surrounded by a skirt of old cottages whose gardens go down to the river. You can get the sense of enclosure by walking along one of these cottage gardens before you start to climb up to the abbey. It's much best done on foot like this. Treat this cottage, for instance, as though it were the city wall. And let's go through it. You can think yourselves back into the past. Here we are, entering the famous city. And now we'll start the climb to the distant sound of the abbey bells. Past limestone walls stuffed with toad flax and topped with valerian and wallflower. Up and up and up between the gardens and the houses all the time getting nearer to the end of the pilgrimage and as you reach the summit of the hill you can stop and look back 
and see how Malmesbury is surrounded by open country and small streams, unique in southern England. That's the view from the doctor's garden and his house is in the middle of the town. By the way, the spire you'll see coming into view above the cow parsley there isn't the abbey. It belonged to one of the parish churches. Of course, Malmesbury is a market town too and has its own old corporation and court and ancient charters and market cross and inns like this where farmers close their bargains with a drink. And there's the market cross at the end of the high street and beyond it, the abbey. Vast, isn't it? Like something in northern France. Vast, isn't it? Yes, vast, wasn't it? For all that's left now of the mighty abbey is the nave, south aisle and the south porch. And this south porch, the finest Norman porch in England, must have seemed like the gate of heaven to pilgrims after their journey over the downs and then through the forests and undrained land. Look at the carving, 12th century, late Norman. Done when England was an island belonging to the Dukes of Normandy and Europe was known as Christendom. And over the inner door, there's a carving of Christ in glory. And there's the nave of the abbey as you first see it. That's Brother Elmer, a Malmesbury monk who tried to fly 900 years ago. He fixed wings to his hands and feet, jumped off a high tower, flew for a furlong, and then fell to the ground, breaking both his legs. William of Malmesbury tells the story. And it was William who must have seen those hounds and owls carved on the arches of the nave. And really, if you don't look east inside the abbey, where it's all shorn off, but look upwards instead, and then turn west, you can get an idea of the former grandeur. Look at the slender tracery of that great west window. But here at the east end, ruins. Here's where the great central tower was, standing on those arches, and supporting a spire higher than that of Salisbury Cathedral. And beyond the crossing, the choir and chapels. This was the mighty beacon to pilgrims and students from all England and Europe. What faith was theirs who built such an abbey? Malmesbury, a city set on a hill which cannot be hid. In the early 60s, John Betjeman made a series of films about the West Country. Thirty years later, these films were discovered curled up in rusty film cans, including his passionate plea to save Bath from the developers, and this affectionate postcard from the British seaside, Western Supermare. Western Supermare, all Western or as some say, Western Super Mary. Gem of the Somerset Coast. Star of the Severn Sea, here we are. I've come dressed for both sorts of weather. Let's see what the guidebook has to say about it. And here we are. Really wet days are exceptional and sports can be enjoyed at any season. Let's try the summer sport of looking for a lodging house. Weston is a town of B&B, &B, bed and breakfast. Miles of bay-windowed houses let lodgings. Blenheim, Chatsworth, Claremont, constant hot water. Lyndhurst, Parkhurst, Holloway, no vacancies. 
Imagine yourself free for the one fortnight in the year. The children are crying, mothers tired after the long journey, fathers a bit irritable. Which shall it be? Homely, home still, sea view, and then have they kept our reservations? Will they remember us from last year? Will we have to get to know new people who are stuck up? Or will it be the same jolly lot we had before? Never mind, we're on holiday. Down here on the front, you can see somebody's been brave enough to have had a swim. But it looks a bit empty down here. Must be time for tea. Baked beans, sausages and tomato. Nearly six o'clock. Time to go in. Let's try this one. It's nice to sit down to something you haven't cooked yourself. Give it your uncle Makes a bit of a change from home Give cooking it too. Give it to Budgie. No, we must give it to you. You won't grow a big girl if Budgie eats your dinner. I wonder if I ought to have put on a coat. He seems to have done. Well, we don't have to wash up afterwards anyhow. And that's a blessing. Time you kiddies went to bed. Get to sleep quickly now. Your dad and I want to go and look at the lights. Oh yes, come along and see them. They're quite a feature. sunset. That's the Isle of Steepholm over there. And that's Anchor Head. Weston, good night. And Weston, good morning. Let me read again from the guidebook. Among the town's chief attractions are the miles of sunbathed sands which slope gently down to the sea. Here, the grown-ups can relax happily in deck chairs while the kiddies build sandcastles. That's a guidebook sentence well worth reading twice. Here, the grown-ups can relax happily in deck chairs while the kiddies build sandcastles. Among other juvenile joys are Weston's famous donkeys and pony carriages. Yes, it's the first time he's ever been on a horse. Well, they aren't horses, actually, are they? They're donkeys. I like to see the kiddies enjoying themselves. I think the donkeys enjoy themselves just as much, don't you? I expect they remember it all the rest of the year. That's if they've got memories. You never know with animals.
Ah, this is better than making machine tools on the night shift, the works. Makes you feel young again, doesn't it? Hurry up, it's nearly dinner time. We must be off and watch the floral clock. 50,000 plants, they say, all different colours. And then, if you wait, Mr Cuckoo will come out of his chalet at half past twelve. Now, Brenda, Mum will look at her watch and you tell me when he comes out. There. Now let's go and find Dad and get some dinner. Well, you've got to find dinner somewhere, haven't you? I mean, they don't allow you back to the hotel till five o'clock, and you've got to eat. It's a long time between breakfast and tea. You can generally find something somewhere, and it's all right so long as it doesn't rain. I like something tasty myself that I can take down to the sands. And after dinner, oh, it's good to have a lie down with your feet up and get a bit of peace. Dear Doreen, we are having quite a nice time here. There's quite a nice beach. I'm learning to swim at last in the swimming pool here, which is quite nice. It holds 1,500 people at once. Marilyn's still afraid of the water. And Carol sits and shivers. Dad spends all day on the putting course. And Mum sends her love, love glad. Well, just look beyond those dads on the putting course and come and see a bit of Old Western. I mean, look at those Regency houses there on the right and the Georgian Terrace right at the back. Can you see it? I want to show you some bits of Old Western that are here when all the holiday people have gone home. For instance, inland, there's the home farm. 17th century on the right, earlier on the left. St Crispin's College mostly Victorian, 1487 foundation, and the centre of the old town has got a quality of East Anglia with the brick and the half timber. And I'm sorry to see that at those old houses there, there's the fatal notice board which says there's going to be a supermarket and they'll be pulled down. But you can get the real spirit of the place down by the river where there's the half timber house blending in so very well with that manor house of local stone, which I should think from that oriel window must be about 15th century. Quite a good model, isn't it? One of the sights of Western Supermare. Ah, well, it's a curious thing that most of what we like to look at nowadays has to be make-believe. Bath is, I suppose, the only town in Britain 
whose fame, prosperity, and beauty depend entirely, or almost entirely, on Georgian architecture. And the story of how that came about, I'm going to tell you. But before we do so, I must tell you that whenever I look at an old building in England, and Bath's full of beautiful old buildings, when I see a particularly beautiful one, a sort of evil voice comes into my ear of a developer coming down from London who says, um, oh, well, Mr. Benjamin, it's all very well for you to speak about uh, old buildings. You don't have to live in them, do you? And then he'll put forward falsely humanitarian uh, views. You know, he'll say, well, it's absurd having a room of that capacity uh, cubic capacity today, far too big, meaning he wants to take it down and build a lot of square boxes and cells for us to live in so as to get a fat rent out of the site. But oddly enough, in Bath, in an age of real civilization, it was a developer who started the story I'm going to tell you. And the only portrait of that developer is here in Bath, or at least it's a copy of it, of John Wood of Bath. And there he is, in a public house in Bath on the corner of Quiet Street, where I'm standing. John Wood arrived in Bath from London in 1727. He found a Somerset cloth town on the banks of the Avon. He was in the building trade, He'd heard there was money in the place. There was a fellow called Rafe Allen running a post office and making 12,000 a year. The Avon was to be made navigable and Bath to be turned into a port. And indeed in 1800 it was and Bristol was linked through Bath to London by water through the Kennet and Avon Canal. And it starts here in Bath. But what John Wood saw he didn't much like. Just a typical country town clustered round an abbey. Old roofs and narrow alleys. And a voice inside me hears something saying, most unhygienic. Yes, but wait and see what Wood dreamed he would make of Bath. Though he was a speculative builder, he was a romantic and an architect. People came to Bath to take the water. The baths were Roman in origin, and Wood decided to build a new Rome here in Britain. That abbey there seemed dull and new. He'd designed a Roman palace, such as he'd seen in Grosvenor Square. There's his design for Queen Square, Bath. It looks like a huge country house, but when you come to look closely, you see a whole row of front doors along the ground floor story. Queen Square Bath must be the first terrace in the world built to look like a single house. And this is Wood's South Parade Bath. It was meant to look on a Roman forum. Wood had never been to Rome, but he'd seen old prints of it, and he wanted to build a forum in Bath. But this dream was never realised. The houses he designed look instead onto a car park and empty space. But another dream was realised. Up the hill from Queen Square, John Wood was going to have a Roman Colosseum from which the invalids who came to Bath would be able to watch performing animals. But when he came to build it, it was much smaller than the original one in Rome, as you can see in that comparative drawing. And it was turned inside out and made into a circle of houses. And indeed, it was the first circle of houses of its kind in the world. There it is, the Circus at Bath, by John Wood, Sr., and finished by his son, John Wood, Jr., in 1754. I can hear the developer's voice in my ear saying, it's very monotonous, 
I grant you that for its time the circus was quite a daring innovation, but today we've got to consider the teenagers. I mean, an enterprising corporation could have made a motorbike track here and a much-needed car park where we're standing and there was no need to repair those houses in the old-fashioned style. So you think. But Bath was copied, the circus at Bath was copied in London and all over the world. Piccadilly Circus, Oxford Circus, they are the origin of the traffic roundabout. John Wood Jr. was as great a man as his father. He designed the assembly rooms. But come and see his most exciting achievement. High up on a sunny slope, above the stuffy hollow of the city, he stretched out half his father's circus into an ellipse and he called it the Royal Crescent, Bath, the first crescent ever built, 1767. Notice the correct oblong panes in the windows. It set a fashion Royal Crescent did. Buxton had one, Brighton had a humbler one, but my favorite is Lansdowne Crescent, Bath by Palmer, 1789, it's very plain. Ironwork instead of carved stone is used for decoration. Notice its delicate design against the sky. Well, Mr. Betjeman, it serves no useful purpose today. And uh, you don't consider the cost of repainting that, I suppose, what it costs the ratepayers. Notice the curve as Lansdowne Crescent turns in an S-bend to Somerset Place. These plain crescents, high above Bath, were among the last to be built. I like them best of all. They depend on proportion. But people were getting tired of living in crescents, and they wanted to live in Bath permanently and have houses of their own. The Englishman's house is his castle, or in this case, on Bathwick Hill, the Greek villa of about 1830. And next to it, there's an Italian palace of about 1840. And if he couldn't afford that, he could at any rate have half a house in this charming semi-detached row of early Victorian houses near Prior Park. They're very plain, but they depend entirely for their effect on proportion as in those two houses there, do you see how the window panes on the right give scale to the building and on the left, where plate glass has been put in, the house looks blind and bombed. At the end of the road, do you notice a falling off? I can't say I do. I like those houses beyond. I like to see bold exterior plumbing, as on this new estate at Twerton. I mean, compare it with this Georgian you so much admire, Mr. Betjeman, in this back garden here. It's very dull, this. I'm glad to see that the advertising profession at this particular place has taken the opportunity to enliven the monotony with a bright note of health-giving products showing our modern civilization and the brightness that we so vitally need here in Bath, or you might need here in Bath on that corner, for instance, there's something really worth looking at. As a Londoner, I like to see a new building in an old setting, as here in your new tech, where the uh, monotony of one side has been relieved very cleverly by a little projecting window. Today, building must express itself honestly and sincerely, as, for instance, in uh, this feature, which uh, might be termed the vital buttocks of the construction. As you can see, it expresses its purpose, whatever that may be, sincerely, and this causes it to blend harmoniously and naturally with the Georgian on the left there. Each age should express itself as it really feels, and you can see how this age feels about Georgian. Well, I suppose you may be right. You must know what you're talking about as you make such a lot of money as a developer. But come with me and look at a bit of development which was never finished. Camden Crescent Bath, 1788. And if you stand 
by the old buildings opposite, you can look down into the valley. Well, I can't say I'm surprised it wasn't a success. You've only got to look down in the valley here to see how people ought to be housed. And you can see too that they've had amenities supplied, dame nature, wildlife, silviculture, just as in front of the Royal Crescent, the same kind of thing. Well, if you think, and there is the Royal Crescent, that there's any similarity between this and what we've just seen, you must be stupid and also malevolent. There's no cause to be offensive, Mr. Bacherman. I don't like the Royal Crescent, and what's more, neither you nor I have to live in it. I mean, think about Bath practically. Look at those balconies. They may be Georgian or somewhere or other, but you couldn't put a kiddie's pram in them. Whereas, if you compare that with these new flats, well, a housewife could put a pram there, and I would emphasise to you that this is the age of the housewife. She has everything she requires. Everything must be hygienically packaged and temptingly displayed to the housewife. I look forward to the day when my company has raised Georgian Bath to the ground and has produced plans that will astonish the world with their beauty, boldness and enterprise. I'm glad to see it started already and uh, also considerably to the profit of my company and at the same time benefiting the human race. John Betjeman talks to his friend Oliver Messel the man who helped restore Bath's assembly rooms. I was all the way through Bath. I know, and um, so you still see the most lovely bits of it. And what I like very much is the way you come out yeah. of a dim alley like that, and then suddenly there's this huge assembly room that's in front of you, the yeah. unexpected, one of the great secrets yes. of a successfully planned English town. Oliver, like mm. there's one question I want to ask you. Your family, for years has been associated with Bath, and you have. The, well, the first, first time I came to Bath, I kind of fell in love with the place because I find it was so wonderful uh, to find there were so many, uh, every corner seemed to be still there, all these marvellous buildings that hadn't been mm. pulled down. And, um, and the way that the whole city was planned uh, with one thought, and so that all these uh, the terraces and, and uh, it, it had a kind of unity to it. I've got some wonderful early guidebooks, some of the earliest guidebooks, which had illustrations of the assembly rooms. And there were all the full descriptions of the assembly rooms, all the, um, particularly of the ballroom. And they've still got in the, in the library a, a small sample of the duck's egg blue that was the color of the walls. And then it describes how the ceiling was interspersed with Naples yellow and how the uh, ceiling of the octagon was um, very much the same as the ceiling of the, of the ballroom. But the, uh, after the work was destroyed, after the building was destroyed... Ah, oh, you can remember it being destroyed. Do you remember the... Did you see well, it? Well, I, I was stationed near here in the, in, the, in the army, and so I came to see it, uh, what was left of it, and it was, it was a very bad state. It's amazing, really, that they managed to reconstruct it so well and so convincingly. Who was the architect for the reconstruction? Um, uh, wasn't it a, 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 Professor a, 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 Richardson, a, 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 my old Richardson. friend? Yes, indeed it was. And then you did the decorative work and the plaster. Um, yes, I did, uh, you know, one of the, the diff most difficult things was the, the, the ceiling in the ballroom. There were, there were records of of the other ceilings yes. and uh, they found fragments you know of the they were all in existence of the of the tea room and but there was very there was nothing left of the ball what did you have to go on well, fortunately i had one of the only photographs that showed a, a little bit of the, of the fairly clearly of the ceiling yes. and then having known it before i was able to um, to, to redraw it all up. And you'll be glad to hear that in the film, when we take people into the assembly rooms, you'll be able to see that ceiling you've done superbly well. It really, uh, it's a great triumph. And uh, indeed, all on, of your work, of the plaster work, and of the professor's 
uh, reconstruction we're showing, but there's one or two rather regrettable things which I know you've had nothing to do with. I'm sure you haven't, because there's been controversy in the paper about it. Those naffy tables and chairs, they, how did they come to be there? I don't know, but they, they must only be temporary. I suppose they hadn't got enough cash for everything. And the bar, did you do a design for a bar? Because the, well, I was, the corporation asked me to do a design of a yes. bar, which I don't myself really feel that the octagon should, uh, there should be a bar at all, a, a permanent bar. Mm -hmm. But, but um, then of course I did design a bar which was passed by the, accepted by the corporation and by the National Trust which is more like a piece of uh, 18th century furniture, um, like a piece of Heffelwhite furniture. But somehow at the last moment, um, after I'd left, uh, gone away this autumn, um, they decided they wanted to have something else, something yes. larger. It has rather a British Railways look, but I'm sure it's only temporary. I'm I sure hope it's it is. temporary. Well, now has come the moment, and it's a very exciting one, for going in to the assembly rooms as they've been restored by uh, Mr. Oliver Messel, whom I've been talking to, with the plaster work, doing the plaster work and the colors, and Professor Richardson, the constructional part. And I expect between them, you'll be thrilled by what you see they've done. Imagine yourself then in a sedan chair, arriving at the assembly rooms and to the music of Mozart without any words we'll make a progress through those assembly rooms avoiding looking at the modern fittings looking at the plaster and that kind of thing through the card room to the tea room ending on the ballroom and after that there's a further surprise which you must wait and see now ready Look at that ball dress. It's called Morning Glory. It was made in 1899 by Worth for the American heiress Lady Curzon. Her husband was Viceroy of India at the time. And it's in the Museum of Costume, here in the assembly rooms. The museum was got together by Doris Langley Moore. And what's very nice about it is it's not too museum-y. There are different rooms showing the different periods and you can see things going on in them. I mean, come and look at this one. There's a house on the outskirts of Bath of about 1850, a mid-Victorian interior, and at my feet, a wee Scottish-dressed English kiddie. And I notice that its dad has uh, Scottish trues too. That, of course, is because of Balmoral, and now everything was growing respectable, and houses were so comfortable, people didn't like to go from them. The large assembly rooms we were looking at weren't popular anymore. Instead, there was home entertainment for the middle classes. I mean, that stereoscope 
1850. Well, it shows three dimensions which we can't show on telly. And I'm sorry that telly doesn't work by gas either. That gas light, which in 1875 shone down on the dressing table there of this young girl putting the final touches to herself before she went to a dance from some high up bedroom in a bath crescent. And I expect the dance was going to be in a private house. And you can see that her poor sister, the younger sister, isn't allowed to go. She's got a migraine or she's too young and she doesn't want mummy to go either. But mummy's all right. There's a nice hot water bottle there for the sister and mummy's going to the dance and feels all right because do you see coming up the stairs at the back there is Martha paid five bob a week and probably comes up 50 stone stairs carrying the hot water and she'll look after the house while the rest are at the dance and will see to the little sister. Victorian bath, Georgian bath. I think really it's the 18th century Georgian bath that sticks most in your mind after you've seen Rome revived in Somerset. Take one last look, as though you were going in a carriage a hundred years ago, down the long perspective of Pulteney Street. 18th century. Today, of course, it's littered with motor cars instead of elegant carriages. But still, you'll have to admit that Bath, with its mellow stone, and elegant perspectives is the most beautiful Georgian city in England. After a hundred years of pride and pleasure, disaster. During the annual tests to check the safety of the structure, two entire spans collapsed. I heard this terrible noise. It, uh, it was a rumbling noise, and I thought it was a, probably a ship had hit the pier end, you know. And I happened to be just looking at the pier all the time. And it just went slowly down. The far end went first, very, very slowly. Oh, it was a terrible sight. <laughs> I just stood. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. I just stood there. And then it just all went down in, and it all drifted away down the channel. And I think that was the worst part, seeing it all drift away. Then began the long fight to save the pier. Engineers came and went. Government inspectors inspected. Most shook their heads. It seemed that Clevedon's lovely pier was doomed. But it wasn't quite dead. And despite the gloomy forecasts, some local optimists were determined that their pier should survive. Few thought they'd really succeed. The fundraising could never quite keep pace with the ever-soaring estimates of the amount of money needed for repairs. But the campaigners were determined. I'd say it was worth spending a million pounds to maintain something like this for future generations. If we don't get on with this and get it done, our people who follow us will say they just couldn't care less, they did nothing, and they let this beautiful old pier, they'll see old pictures of it and they'll say, what the devil happened to this? They just let it go. But in the early 70s, not everyone agreed. Well, not really, no. Why not? Because it would cost a lot of money, or what? Well, there's other things that want to in Cleveland rather than the pier. I think it's a lot of money to spend on something like a pier when 
I wonder in some ways, in fact, if more people don't come to Cleveland to see the Broken Pier than they would if it was a complete pier. Cleveland became a divided town. Eventually, it went to a public inquiry. And the preservationists won the day. A plea had been sent by the poet laureate, Sir John Betjeman, who, unlikely though it may seem, had developed a passion for Clevedon's pier. It could only happen in England. It is itself a beautiful and elegant cast-iron structure. It recalls a painting by Turner, or an etching by Whistler or Sickert, or even a Japanese print. Without its pier, Clevedon would be a diamond with a flaw. Round the marble arch, round the marble arch, what a glorious sight to see, all oh, the big of the infantry, around the marble arch, round and round they march, they know how to get round the girls, around the marble arch. Randolph Sutton is among the last of the great music hall entertainers, one of the few surviving stars of the good old days. He spent more than half a century on the halls, and now, in his 70s, he's performing still, in the style he made famous. In his native Bristol, Randolph Sutton discusses a full life on and off the stage with his old friend and admirer, John Betjeman. Where were you born in Bristol? I was born in Bristol, 29 Anglesey Place just about no more than four minutes walk from here. And did you go to school there? I went to school right opposite the house in Anglesey Place. And the Downs were quite near? The Downs were very, very near. I spent a half of me childhood days in the downs you know and when you were a small boy did you slide down that gully which has been worn smooth by a million bristol bottoms when my mother had five children and it was her washing day we were sent out about nine in the morning and said don't come back all day so we played about on the downs of course bristol you know ran i think it's the most attractive city in england without a doubt. It's full of variety. I mean, down there uh, below in the Avon Valley, where there's the uh, old city with its memories of wine, slave trade, yes. tobacco, and those alleys, the little old churches. And then up here at Clifton, the elegant terraces, and the presence and this country and that marvellous Avon Gorge and the suspension bridge yeah. just beside us here. Now, there's one other thing. Where did you learn to sing? Well, John, it, uh, it's nice of you to ask me that because it started really in the choir, All Saints Church in the City.
What did you do in order to keep up your interest in singing? Well, then, you see, uh, I used to go round to these, what we used to call the local concerts, you see. Yes. At the little halls, you know, church halls, you know. Yes. Uh, mother's meetings, and I used to sing to them, you see. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'd get uh, one and six or two shillings, with half a crown a night, it was according to the, the hall. And sometimes I was lucky to get two halls in a night, you know. And one very amusing incident happened. I was working two halls one night, and the second hall was in Broad Mead. Yes. And I went down there and, and started singing my song, and somebody politely came and pulled me off and gave me my half a crown and told me to get out of the building. Well, of course, I, I was dreadfully upset, I did, you know, dreadfully upset. I said, what have I done? They said, don't you realize, don't you realize that this is a band of hope meeting and you've just sung a song, come and have a drink with me down at the old bull and bush. <laughs> so that's the first time I've ever been paid off. How did you get on, though, uh, you were singing the Band of Hope and that kind of thing. How did you first get a sort of an engagement of any sort? Well, then, you see, every year, you see, I had a holiday from Robinson's on the house. We had two weeks' holiday, and I went to Burnham-on-Sea for my two weeks' holiday. The first week I was there, there was a little Piero troupe on the sand singing, and I got to know them. And the, the, the comedian was having a benefit What's a the benefit is, is when, in those days when you were paid very badly, but the boss of the show would give you one night's takings, and he called that your benefit, you see. Oh, I see. And this night it was the comedian's benefit. And I said, would you like me to sing a song for you as an extra turn? Yes. Well, of course, they laughed and thought, this is going to be a bit of a joke. Yes, do sing, you see. So I went on and sang. We can love and do and coo in a week when built a shamrock green will make those... They were such a wonderful audience to me that they wouldn't listen to the comedian after that at all, you see. <laughs> then the man who ran the concert party said, of course, you're a professional on holiday. I said, no. No, I'm from Bristol. I'm just on a holiday here. So he said, well, we're going to Evesham next week. He said, would you, would you like to join the troop and come to Evesham? Yes. But I'll give you 35 shillings for the week. So, of course, I went. That was really the... Then I came back to Robinson's, of course. You, it was just a fortnight's holiday now. Yes. There's a difference between five shillings a week and 35 shillings. A lot, of but course. what did your father say? Was he pleased? Well, he didn't speak to me hardly. They thought I was raving mad and said, if you leave home, you know, and you're hard up, don't write for money because you'll get none from me. See? So you had this awful choice he, to make. Of course, he thought I had a very good position in Robinson's at five shillings a week. But I wanted to go on the stage, you see. Well, then how did you get on uh, eventually? Well, then the, 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 the fellow that I went to Evesham for ran a pantomime at the Opera House Chart. Yes. And wrote to me and said, you, you're wasting your time, you should be in the business, and I can offer you a pantomime at the Opera House Cheltenham, Robinson Crusoe, at 35 bob a week. And I took the plunge and told Robinson's that if, before this, Robinson said, you either come and give your mind to the, in the cashier's office or, and not the concerts, otherwise you'll have to go. So I went and gave me notice in it, and I went on the stage, and that's how I started. The choice was made. There was to be no going back. A lifetime in the theatre lay ahead. And this is where the teenage Randolph Sutton was living when his stage career began. In rooms above a shop in the Barton Hill district of Bristol. Styles have changed since then. Styles of living, styles of work, styles of entertainment. Even the place has changed. They've pulled down the Bristol you knew, Rand, most of it. They certainly have. And even up there, fish and chips now. Ah, yes, but it wasn't fish and chips before, you know, when I stayed there. When I lived there, you know, it was a general store, you know. That was your father's shop, was that it? That was my father's shop, yes. When he retired? When he retired, them. that's right. And I used to take the groceries round in a basket before I went to school, which was, of course, Barton Hill School. And after that, E.S. and A. Robinson. Would get, then when, when I was old enough, of course, off I went to E.S. and A. Robinson. Well, let's go and look at it now ourselves. On the Bristol Bridge, eh?
here we are at Robinson's building with all Bristol round us. Now you tell me on the way here, Ran, that in Barton Hill you used to perform in that public house opposite the shop, is that right? Yeah, the Russell Arms, Morton Street. I used to get behind the counter there when I was about 12 and sing to the customers, all free, of course. But when you started professionally in theatre, where did you first start? The Opera House, Cheltenham, Robinson Crusoe pantomime at 35 bob a week, which of course I took. Then I had a season at Blackpool. After the season at Blackpool, we toured, went to Stans for a week and Lytham for a week, and eventually came back to Burnham-on-Sea for a week. And funnily enough, my mother and father were at Burnham on a week's holiday. I was at the town hall Bur Burnham then, you see. Mother was very thrilled, of course, and father, all father said, we should have let him go sooner. Oh, that's nice. That's all my father said to me. Never said anything more? Nothing more. Did he live to see you famous? No, no, never, didn't live, no, to see that. So he knew he'd done the right thing? I think so, I, yes, I really do think so, yes. Yes, marvellous. Mm. Then came the 1914 war. What happened to you in that, Rand? Well, I had three years in France, you know. What regiment? And, uh, the Welsh regiment, 13th okay. Welsh. Yes. Uh, and uh, naturally I travelled piano parts in Mahaversack, all over France, because I used to sing to the boys in YMCA, the cow sheds, out in the open fields, anything I used to sing to keep the boys entertained. What was your, uh, the song you remember best of those times? The, the best song that the boys knew was Goodbye. Though it's hard to come, I know I'll be tickled to death to go, don't cry. Don't sky, there's a silver lining in the sky. Bonsoir, old thing, cheerio, chin chin, napu, tootaloo, good. You must be one of the first people to sing. I was. Don't cry, and then goodbye to the war. That's right. And. You started off in... But then I came back and went into a show called All Aboard at the Theatre Royal Worcester. Oh, I'm sorry to tell you, that beautiful theatre was pulled down deliberately, only just lately. It was Disgraceful, isn't it? What a shame. And then, after you'd finished with All Aboard... Well, I didn't really finish with All Aboard. During the, the tour of All Aboard, the Daily Mail were saying that there were no artists in the West of England fit for the West of England audience. And the Daily Mail took it up. No new funny men are found for London because managers do not go into the provinces to look for them. Funny man Fart, playing principal boy in pantomime. Mr. Randolph Sutton was discovered where so many funny men graduated in the broadhead circuit. The war had taken them all, mm. you see, so they started to find them, you see, and... and uh, they came up as far as Birmingham, ran into Leslie Henson. Yes. And Leslie Henson said, Don't waste your time. Try and find a fellow called Sutton. I came across him in France. He's, he's one of those rare people who can make a bad song good. Mr. Sutton has had offers of engagements in London from Sir Oswald Stoll and Mr. C.B. Cockram. Mr. Randolph Sutton is at the Elephant and Castle Theatre in the review Dream Girl. His salary next year will equal that of a cabinet minister. And I was getting 50 pounds a week. I had any amount of Western offers, and the highest they offered me was 50 pounds, and I yes. just wouldn't go. Yes. I didn't think I was right for the West End. Mm. I was singing to the factory girls, and all these, and the girls were screaming and yelling my choruses out, but I didn't think I was West End. In fact, you were sort of Beatle of your day. And, I, should, and I should think so, yes. Just one, <laughs> just one Beatle, not, not four, one. I remember the first time I saw you, was at the Bedford Camden Town. Then after that, the, the, review, the review wasn't doing very, very well, and they found they couldn't pay me the 50 pounds a week. Yes. So rather than take a cut, I thought to myself, right, I'll put my own review on, yes. which I did, called Spare Parts. Yes. Eventually, we had a week at the Bedford Camden Town. Yes, that's where I saw you, yes. I remember. <clears throat> and I'm singing, I'm sitting on top of the world. And on the Tuesday, the door of the dressing room opened, in walked a man said, You don't know me, but my name's Val Parnell. If ever you want any variety, let me know. But don't come in the middle of the summer when it's hot, because business is bad. And how much do you reckon you put in your pocket at the end of the week? So I said, Oh, I said, I, 
between 50 and 60 pounds. He said, well, I'll give you some hordes at 75 if you'll take them. Which, of yeah. course, I did, you see. So the review came off the road and I went into variety. And funnily enough, the first variety date I played was the Hippodrome Bristol. See, and Bristolians knew me, and of course yes. I did enormously. And since then, I didn't ever go back to review, but I stuck to music hall. Now, Ran, you've got a wonderful sense of an audience. And you know what people like to hear sung. And I've heard you sing to all sorts of people all over the place, choosing the songs that suits them. What was the first song that you sung that you knew everybody liked? The first chorus song that I sang uh, was a well-known song, now naturally very, very well-known, Let's All Go Down the Strand. And have a banana. And then there was a song when I went to sort of toured the tats, as we call it, the very tatty little places. Yes. Uh, come round and hear the gramophone. Come round and hear its lovely tone. So on, you see. I'm not going to sing the chorus. I don't get paid for that, you see. <laughs> <laughs> then the other thing, uh, those two were the... I suppose those two were the earliest ones. What would you say now was your most famous song? Well, now, you know My as well favorite. as I do. Now you exactly. know your old favourite. I've always got to sing when I come out and have dinner with you. Is Mother Kelly's Doorstep, you see. Yes. And who wrote Mother Kelly's well, Doorstep? Well, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful man. A wonderful man. Of course, he's passed away. But he wrote a lot of my songs. And he was a man called George Stevens. Used to take sacks of coal around in the daytime from door to door, and this was his hobby. Where did he do this? He used to go to the Horns Kennington, a public, public house, and sit down and write a song, and then he would come up to sing the day after, I've written your song, Ran, and, and he'd sing it over to me. He wrote that AB number of mine, oh, Harvest maybe. Moon, he wrote, all that, you see. What a wonderful man. He was a genius. Did he get well paid for the job? Not really. In those days, you, you, did, they did, you didn't give them very much, you see. There weren't royalties and things. No, those well, days. no, no, no those days. A, you got, a fiver was, was, a, was a godsend to them, you see. Well, here we are, Ran, with all Bristol at our feet, your home city. Are there any parts of it for which you've got special affection? Many, many parts, really, John. I mean... <laughs> After all said and done, I was born here, Bristolian, and lived here for years and years, you know. Several little spots that I've got with great affection, you know. But one, I know you're going to laugh at this, really, is Christmas Steps. I know you'll say, well, why? I'll tell you, when I was quite young, and I were doing these concerts at night, and getting home rather late, I used to to a Band of Hope concert and get me half a crown and then get at the bottom of the steps and run up the steps like mad about half past eleven at night. Found Mother waiting in the garden, you see, and shh, don't make a noise, your father's asleep. So I crept in, gave Mother a half, one and six out of the half a crown, you see. Hush money, you know. Don't say anything to Father what time I came in. So, of course, the mother said, no, that's all right, now go to bed, don't make a noise. And off I go to bed, still out of breath with the Christmas steps, you know. But I think now when I see Christmas steps, every step means something to me. But sometimes if I didn't run up, I would sing to make it easier to get up right up to the top. Every step meant a tune to me, so I sang. Singing low, bye bye, blackbird. Where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet, so is she. Bye bye, blackbird. No one here can love or understand me. Oh, what hard luck stories! They all had me Make my bed and light the light I'll arrive late tonight Blackbird, bye-bye What other parts of Bristol? 
the wonderful, wonderful theater roar. Yes. I never, never been happier than when I take my pantomimes there and all the wonderful girls from Martin Sun and Halls, and Fry's factories, all used to come and queue up for the early doors of the pit, start to scream, laugh, and bring their sandwiches and a thermos of tea, and stay there for 16 solid weeks to capacity. And of course now, Ren, you're getting more offers of work than you can cope with. Well, to be truthful and without being big-headed, yes, I, I get a lot of work and I've got to refuse a lot. And what's the song they always want? Now listen, <laughs> shall I tell you something? Just been wandering all alone down Paradise Row. When I was a kitty, I had a sweetheart, and down there we would go. I'd call her Nelly, and she called me Joe, and we would romp there hand in hand. Then we both sit down on a doorstep there. And we'd picture the future grand On Mother Kelly's doorstep I'm wondering now If little girl Nelly Remembers Joe And does she love me On Mother Kelly's doorstep Down Paradise Row On Mother Kelly's doorstep I'm wondering now Mother Kelly's 